I want to end with a with sort of a philosophical question that that touches on a theme that you mentioned. So we talked about how there's there's really um, a sort of renegade skater spirit that exists in some of the great minds, and you know we we keep throwing around our friend Rick as an example in the creative space. But you know we talked talked briefly about Richard Feynman, who we didn't even get into some of our our stories about Feynman. Um, and so there's no question that you need people who are willing to question everything. I mean, it's uh, it's no small miracle that the Apple campaign of Think Different was arguably one of the most successful ad campaigns of all time. But we also have to reconcile that science requires a lot of fundamental knowledge to even give you the privilege to think differently. Let's not forget before you do the PhD, you've done four years of undergraduate coursework, which admittedly is mostly learning an existing body of knowledge. Correct. You then spent two years doing a PhD where you're learning an existing body of knowledge in a much narrower area than your undergraduate, but at a much deeper level. Mm -hmm. You take a comprehensive exam that we didn't even talk about how challenging the comps are before you, depending on the university especially, before you even earn the right to now go sit in the lab to start to think different, which by the way is essential. If you go into the lab, you can't by definition have a PhD thesis that's the same as somebody else's. Right. You're not going to get it. It has right. to be unique work. And to me, I think what's very difficult about communicating science in the public is that line is difficult to explain. And it's very easy in social media, for example, to just assume everybody's an expert. Like, there's no real ability to distinguish between signal and noise. Right. Or assume that if somebody got something wrong, that they're wrong about everything else they're saying, yeah. which is certainly not the case. So, you know, I was interviewed on a podcast recently and someone posed the question to me around this. And, you know, I didn't have a great answer. You know, I, I think of like, if I think of my purpose um, in that sense of source, I think of it as hopefully just getting people to think about things and hopefully providing them with enough substrate, both in terms of the knowledge and the, the mental models and the frameworks and the ability to have some of the critical thinking. Um, then you're, uh, they're, they're being armed with a tool that will allow them to, to look at the world and look at other claims and stuff. But to be honest with you, I have no idea if I, able to do that. Like it strikes me as a very difficult thing to do. So the, huh. my question is not about anything that I'm doing. It's more about how do you see your role in addressing, I don't have a better word for it other than what's going to sound a little bit crass, which is just a crisis of scientific literacy and a crisis of scientific literacy that has led to a crisis of confidence. Yeah. Well, first I just want to say that not only are you getting people to think differently or think a bit more deeply or a lot more deeply? You're also giving them very useful information and I, you're being humble and I, I, I understand it's genuine, but I do want to say that as a consumer of your information, but also as somebody who pays a lot of attention to the landscape of the space, the impact is real and it's significant. Um, and I've long been interested in the kind of the common themes between different movements and cultures. And I watched it happen in skateboarding. I knew well enough to know that I wasn't going to play a major role. I probably could have run a company or been involved in that. Although with my social and professional skills back then, I mean, I, I've seen fist fights in the offices of some of these companies, but <laughs> some of them are, are many, worth many hundreds of millions of dollars now. And they run like, you know, beautifully because it's a family feel. So a lot of that kind of craziness of the past is kind of no longer around. They have HR departments and things. Um, but also the landscape of science. I realize there are people that are in this just for ambition. There are people that have real passion like Ben and ambitious and everything in between. And likewise, within the social, social media sphere, right? You, you're, and health education, you're seeing people that are just compelled to do it because they love it. They are also ambitious. You see people with just pure ambition. They're just, you can tell they're just grabbing onto every recent event as a way to, to get some views and likes and grow their channels. I, their fate is obvious to me over time. 
Um, I'm not being cynical, but it's just, you look at any other endeavor like music or art or science for that matter, you know where that's going to end. It's just going to end. They're going to flame out as we say. I think that in thinking, thinking about these different universes of or cultures, the, the, the human, um, the human aspect comes through. And I think it at least gives me one answer to your question, which is, you know, what are we trying to do here? Like, what are we actually trying to do? So for me, it's, I have several things that are, that are really like mantras. It's I want to communicate the, the beauty and utility of biology. I want to do that by being a teacher and to some extent a storyteller, but a story about biology. And I want to be a giver. I just want to give, give, give. Now, you raise an important point, which is formal rigorous education often involves not doing anything creative, but it is the especially in biology. I right. mean, I think this is the difference, right? Sorry to interrupt you, but in mathematics, that's not necessarily the case. Like right. Ramanujan didn't have the formal education; it wasn't necessary. He was able to derive the insights from Gauss to Newton to Euler right. all the way through, and he in the dirt was literally coming up with the creative insights, and and that is why mathematics and science are actually fundamentally very different things. Mm -hmm. And especially in biology, I, I, I was there's say, no discipline of science in which this thing that we're talking about is more present than in biology. The fact set is unbearably large. It's unbearably large. And unfortunately, as Feynman pointed out, the or as Feynman pointed out, at fortunately, Feynman pointed out that unfortunately, taxonomy gets you nowhere. That's right. Ta just knowing the names of things, something that I'm, I, you know, I, humbly, I'm very good at. I can memorize the names of things, um, you know, many orders of magnitude beyond like yeah, what, what, was... what is necessary or useful, right? I can tell you that we could have sat here and I could tell you the 20 or so different kinds of ganglion cells in the retina, how they code visual space, what they inform the brain likely or not. And the only thing that would have mattered is for you to understand that some cells sense motion, some cells sense uh, contrast, some encode color information and that it's built up in kind of a hierarchy pyramid pyramidal model to give you something like face recognition. That's all that matters. It doesn't matter if it's the alpha cell, the beta cell, the theta cell, the schmata cell. It doesn't matter. The names don't matter. In biology, so much of it is, is showing um, some degree of ability in the taxonomy. Okay. Is it useless? No, because it sets up a common dialogue. That's why taxonomy is useful. It allows different people in different labs to communicate. But it doesn't teach you rule sets. So if we go back to, I don't want to get back into prefrontal cortex per se, but let's think about the Stroop task. If I give you letters and numbers in different colors and you have to do that, you can't do the Stroop task if you can't speak the language that that's read or recognize that, you know, seven plus seven is 14, right? Seven plus seven equals 14 is just true. That's not changing. There's nothing creative about it, but you can't come up with alternate rule sets if you don't have the basic substrates, the basic building blocks. So I look at an undergraduate degree or even a high school degree and an undergraduate degree as developing the raw materials from which to then start resampling those raw materials, which is the PhD, into hopefully what is truly novel, but many PhDs are truly novel, but not terribly impactful for their field. Most PhDs, right. in fact. And most postdocs, it's like your attempt to do it again, to show I, I can do it twice. Yep. That's basically it. Then you get your own laboratory. And there are some labs that survive very well by just kind of turning a crank and, and doing the same thing over and over again. The, the fundamental discoveries come from people really taking risk. So I think in the social media space, there are a couple of different issues here. One is, do people need to have a formal rig rigorous education in something? I would say yes, but we need to put air quotes around formal. You look at a guy like Rick Rubin, I don't know what Rick's undergraduate education was in, but I doubt it was in music producing. Um, uh, but was in but, but his formal rigorous education is in the real world of producing music. Right, but again, I, I think if we limit this to science, it gets more complicated. So in that case, I think you, I would hope that the young person out there or even older person out there who really wants to get good at science and scientific thinking put themselves through the hard filter that is a formal rigorous education in that thing. The, the beauty of looking at things through the lens of biology or through the lens of science and experimentation is that really at its essence, your goal is to falsify your own, what you think are best right. ideas. Right, and then this gets to the 
complete other end of the spectrum so that the listener doesn't assume for a moment we're just sitting here being elitist saying you shouldn't be the ones talking about science if you don't have a background. I'm going to bring it right back to Ben's comment to you when he had his epiphany, which is the medical profession doesn't know that much. Well, exactly. And I think that, you know, I can't speak for Ben, but I do remember most of what he said um, to me anyway. And it's very clear that scientific literacy in the general public does not require a formal education in science if you, I think it was Max Delbruck that said, assume zero knowledge and infinite intelligence. I think about that all the time. I believe that people are curious and that if you give them the raw materials to understand what you're about to tell them, they can understand pretty much everything. I know there's the whole Feynman quote of, you know, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, then you don't really understand it. That's true. I also think that you can take adults or younger people and educate them. You give them a minimum of nomenclature and you emphasize that the nomenclature isn't really the point, right? We call it prefrontal cortex. We could have called it green monkey tree. doesn't matter. It's in a rule set, context appropriate setting machine in your brain and it's behind the forehead. doesn't even matter. It's behind the forehead, but it helps you remember prefrontal. Okay. So what's important is the algorithm that it uses. And I think that in biology, we're always talking about processes. And so one thing that I think is, is really important and can be communicated to the general public, regardless of educational background, is that most of the time when you're paying attention to science, forget the nouns, focus on the verbs, right? You want to understand how the brain wires up, maybe a discussion that we can have next time or axon regeneration. Forget that it's an axon, just kind of understand an axon is like a wire. Okay, that helps you visualize it. But I can put in your head a, the ideas of a number of different processes that are involved from going to sp from sperm meets egg to a baby and a brain. Why? Because it's a bunch of processes that when you understand one of them, you can more easily understand the next and the next. Taxonomy doesn't do that. If I tell you that brain area is called that, it doesn't give you one shred of a hint of what a different brain area is called at all. In fact, it probably confuses you. So in many ways, teaching the verbs of biology is what I think is necessary. And I've started even doing this in the in the public discourse that I'm involved in. You know, I've talked about the importance of getting morning sunlight, why low solar angle sunlight actually has more yellow blue contrast. And even though you don't perceive it through these cells, you look at it through cloud cover, you see that yellow blue contrast is what activates the cells in the retina. It says it's morning. When the sun's overhead, no yellow blue contrast. You can take a picture of it with your phone and see sunset, yellow blue and orange contrast activates these cells. So what do you need people to understand? You don't need to see the sunrise. You need to see the sun rising, the verb. You don't need to see it cross the horizon. You need to see it when it's low in the sky. If they hear that and they then remember, oh yeah, because that's when it's yellow and blue. Now it doesn't matter what the ganglion cells are called, melanops and schmelanops, and it doesn't matter. What you've got them on is a verb. And when you teach people the verb action of biology, I believe they start to understand the real mechanism and the real utility. And then the nouns kind of, forgive my language, they don't really, they don't, no one gives a shit. It doesn't matter, especially not to the general public that's mostly trying to just think about health information. We saw this during the pandemic. The problem with the vaccines were these cute little things of like, okay, here's the viral, not cute, but ominous little spiky thing. And here's the spike protein and this and that. And they show these little movies. And you know what people really wanted to know? They wanted to know, how do I know it's going to be safe? And what kind of safety is it going to afford me in terms of my health? Like, what are the probabilities? And then even when you told them that, a lot of people were still kind of standoffish about it. And then there was this- Well, actually, I think you just hit on a very important point, which um, uh, I, would, I would argue that someone asked me this question also recently, knowing my love for mathematics. Um, would the world be a better place if everybody knew calculus through freshman calculus in college? And I said, no but they would, the world would be a much better place if people knew freshman statistics and probability yes. through freshman college. That's right. That's and what's missing. That's right. And the way to understand statistics, statistics, excuse me, of course, you have to understand the mode, the medium, et cetera, the mean, the median, and the mode. But what's really important was, is once you understand standard deviation, you don't care if people know what one or two standard deviations from the mean is. You want them to know what it represents. In other words, there's a verb in there. Well, you also want them to understand what probability means. Right. A 2% chance that something is going to happen, what does that mean? Because that thing is either going to happen or not going to happen. There's a binary outcome. Let's just make it simple. But how do you, 
imagine that a priori? How does expected value fit into that? And that I think gets to this point you raise, which is, you know, it is important. And I think that's why so much science got, so much scientific communication got destroyed during the pandemic is you had the people who were in charge treating everybody like idiots. So they didn't want to take the time to exp explain probabilistic things. You know, is the vaccine safe? Yes, it's safe on average. Is there any chance of an adverse outcome? Of course there is. There's an adverse, there's an, a chance of an adverse outcome when you take a Tylenol or a baby aspirin. Mm -hmm. And we have to be able to sort of talk through that. And I, I guess that's, that's the thing that just keeps me up at night is like, why can't we introduce nuance when it matters and not be fooled by noisy nuance that doesn't matter, which people like mm -hmm. to interject as a way to, at the worst, hide their nefarious intentions and at the best, miss the point. Right. No, I think that people were treated like idiots during the pandemic and they responded in it in a very angry way. And when you treat people like idiots, uh, they act like idiots or they get angry. Um, and, or they think, or it's like a teenager who realizes that their parents don't understand anything. You know, when people start seeing a lot of flip-flopping in messaging, I think that when people understand or at least can visualize or experience the verb action of biology, it, they are forever changed. Yeah, that's if point. I give you 50 facts about the brain, it doesn't change you. But if I explain uh, the process underlying even just five of your daily experiences or what it means when you get tired, what that is, how to ameliorate that, um, what it means when you get stressed and how to deal with that. If I teach you the mechanisms that underlie those tools, then the tools are forever embedded in you. Now, one has to be very careful because I, I always say the best case is where you can teach people something that it works the first time and every time like sunlight viewing, you know, in a two, three days, everything's changed if you're doing that consistently at the right times or certain patterns of breathing for stress mitigation or et cetera, or exercise for that matter. But you have to be very careful because if you give people something with the promise that it works the first time and every time and it doesn't, yeah. then trust you, you, lose, you lose trust. So you have to build trust over time. But, and again, I don't know the proper language for this, but I think once people understand mechanisms, it must be the same way that physicians and psych or psychologists start to see an interaction between two different people. And it's like, it's like uh, those Peanuts cartoons. It's like womp, 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 chatter between the two of them, but it's the dynamics. And they go, aha, the algorithm is this. Here's what's going on here. Here's how to fix it. And I think we need a better understanding of algorithms, right? I mean, you're not gonna teach somebody calculus by giving them a, a showing them a problem set and a solution, you're going to teach them how you arrive at solutions to, to any problem set using a particular algorithm, more or less, right? Uh, I had the great, greatest uh, person who taught me some complex areas of calculus. Uh, well, anyway, you know what? I'm not going to get into it. It's such a long story, but it, but I agree with you completely that that when you, when you, one way I think about it in, in, in calculus specifically is if you can come to understand things from first principles and never you know, go into things where you have to memorize anything. Um, the less you can rely on rote memory, the better.